All right, welcome to week four. When this week's over, you'll be halfway done with this, uh, this course in advanced criminological theory uh, or human behavior, which, uh, whichever you prefer to call it. Uh, this week, we're talking about psychopathy and mental disorders and their relationship to crime. Uh, please remember that the midterm exam is due at the end of this week. Um, it is already available to you. Uh, you do not have to finish it all in one sitting. Uh, there are options uh, in, your, in your access portal where you can answer a question or two and then save it and come back to it later. Um, I strongly recommend that you uh, answer the questions, take the test, take your time to answer the questions over the week. Uh, also keep in mind that if a professor gives you an entire week to finish an exam, and do, does so with the full knowledge that you have access to your book and all those other things while you're taking the exam, uh, keep in mind that uh, expectations for the quality of answers is rather high. And so uh, take your time, answer questions thoroughly. Um, uh, keep it in essay format. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk about psychopathy, and then later we'll talk about mental disorders. Uh, psychopathy is, and I want to start out just by prefacing this, that psychopathy is not an official classification, not a mental disorder uh, that is defined in uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, uh, basically the uh, uh, supreme guidebook for psychologists. Uh, it's the, the DSM-4, uh, as it is commonly referred to is the manual that psychologists use. Uh, it contains all the diagnosis, the diagnosis criteria for mental disorder, mental disease. Uh, understand that you could spend all week looking at it for psychopathy and you won't find it. Uh, it's not there. Uh, psychopathy, while it is a common used term uh, in our courts, it's a common used term when talking about uh, disturbed criminals, it is not technically a mental, uh, not technically a uh, psychological disorder. Uh, it is classified as a personality disorder, but keep in mind this is we're still talking about what is primarily a legal definition uh, or a um, a definition we use during intake to classify offenders uh, or identify treatment needs, um, uh, highlight for uh, correctional and law enforcement personnel, uh, behavioral manifestations that uh, an officer might expect uh, from an individual uh, because there are uh, certainly things that one can expect from, from someone classified as a psychopath. Okay, psychopathy is a personality disorder characterized by the inability to form human attachments. And that is, while there are other, while there are other uh, behavioral manifestations of psychopathy, um, the inability to form human attachments really is the key, uh, the keystone to understanding psychopathy. Uh, psychopathy is comprised of numerous affective, interpersonal, and behavioral characteristics with two essential features. Uh, the first being aggressive narcissism, uh, and the second being antisocial life, lifestyle. Um, a uh, The DSM-4 defines personality disorders as an enduring pattern uh, of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly uh, from the expectations of the individual culture. Uh, it is per se per pervasive and inflexible, uh, tends to have an onset in adolescent or early childhood, uh, is stable over time, and leads to distress or impairment. Now uh, that's on, if you want to look it up, uh, that definition is on page 685 of the DSM-4. A psychopath, uh, like I mentioned, is has never actually been an official classification. You won't find it listed under personality disorders. Um, similar, there are some similar disorders that uh, both used to be and currently are in the DSM. Um, the first diagnose, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, which was published in 1952, uh, contained a personality disorder uh, known as uh, so sociopathy. Um, 
And so individuals that we might call psychopaths today were referred to as sociopaths. Um, but that in later editions of the DSM-4, uh, the term sociopath uh, has been dropped. Um, in the present DSM, uh, you find the official label that psychologists would put on an individual that the system would call psychopath and that disorder is called antisocial personality disorder um, which again that's the closest that uh, the DSM comes to the traditional concept of psychopathy. Research does show that antisocial personality disorder or a APD which is all referred to it as APD most of the time uh, and psychopathy are not the same. And psychopathy really is a more powerful construct in predicting uh, the dangerousness of individuals. When we talk about psychopathy and how to define it, how to describe it, um, a man named Hare is probably one of the, one of the more notable um, scholars that have looked into this. Um, he describes three different types of psychopaths. Um, he starts first with the primary psychopath. Uh, this is uh, the true psychopath, the, the person who really is a psychopath. Uh, um, this is the individual with the certain psychological, emotional, and behavioral traits uh, that make him different uh, from not just the general population at large, but also the general criminal population. Um, but next, Hare says that there are secondary psychopaths. Uh, these are individuals that display antisocial or violent acts because of severe emotional problems and inner conflicts. Uh, these are not true psychopaths, but they tend to get labeled as such uh, in the media, if not uh, by criminal justice professionals uh, who are not fully trained. Then there is the dissocial psychopath, uh, Hare's last uh, typology. Uh, that a social psychopath is an individual who displays aggressive antisocial behavior uh, that they have learned from their subculture. Uh, so this is a person who may have some of the behavioral manifestations that we come to associate with psychopathy, but they are, rather than the result of some emotional conflict uh, or upbringing or any of the other things that we'll talk about as uh, potential causes of psychopathy, they act in this manner as a result of their subculture. Maybe they belong to a gang, they've grown up in a gang family, maybe uh, a grand gang neighborhood, uh, maybe they uh, grow up in a family where they've learned uh, this type of behavior. Uh, antisocial personality disorder, which is uh, what I refer to as being what is actually listed in the DSM-4, uh, antisocial personality disorder, these individuals uh, have distinct behavioral manifestations that are very similar to psychopathy, but a good way of defining uh, the antisocial personality disorder um, is this is someone with a pervasive pattern of disregarding the rights of others. Uh, and so maybe that's part of what it is to be a psychopath, uh, but not, not all. Uh, um, someone can have APD and not actually be a psychopath. Secondary and dissocial psychopaths, uh, these terms can be misleading because their behavior and backgrounds uh, have little similarity to true or primary psychopaths. Uh, and so they're not really psychopaths, but we label them such largely because of their high recidivism rates, and you know, we assume that those recidivism rates are tied to behavioral manifestations uh, that typically cause us to think that they're psychopaths. The primary psychopath, the, the guy we're really interested in here, uh, engages in antisocial behavior as a result of genetic and biological predisposition. First day with a new tongue. Let me try again. The primary psychopath engages in antisocial behavior as a result of a genetic or biological predisposition directed by particular psychodynamic forces that occur in infancy. Okay, remember our discussion a couple weeks ago about uh, biosocial criminology. And here, uh, this definition of psychopathy uh, is, a pretty, is another example of a biosocial perspective, where you have an individual with a genetic or a biological predisposition. So there is something biologically 
um, psychologically just off about this individual. So there are some causes, uh, either genetic or biological, but those alone do not make the individual a psychopath but it is also the psychodynamic forces in, that occur in infancy. So there's something that happens when the individual is a child, uh, in an extreme early childhood, uh, that causes the individual to become a psychopath. Um, a secondary psychopath, on the other hand, their antisocial behavior uh, is the result strictly of environmental factors. Um, membership in a deviant group, abuse as a child, uh, the key difference is there's no genetic or biological predisposition present with a secondary psychopath. Um, the fundamental, uh, and then, but while that's a good difference, the fundamental difference between primary psychopaths and secondary to social psychopaths uh, is the ability to attach emotionally to others and to experience natural anxiety associated with human attachment. Uh, primary psychopaths uh, are very limited uh, in their ability uh, to make emotional attachments with others, um, almost to the point where it is darn near impossible for them. Um, you know, some people would say, well, the psychopath is an individual who doesn't feel emotion. You know, that's kind of the old description of the sociopath, and that's not exactly true. Um, for the most part, uh, psychopaths don't process emotion. And so they have a hard time knowing how to deal with them because they don't feel them. But they do feel very extreme emotions, very intense emotions. In fact, something has to be, uh, an emotional stimuli has to be very intense uh, for them to feel something. Um, primary psychopaths uh, perform, excuse me, form no uh, emotional attachments. Uh, generally is a result of some early childhood obstruction uh, and as a result, they're capable of causing harm, uh, and often great harm to others, uh, with little or no anxiety. Um, uh, they don't feel remorse. Um, they don't, I don't know if they feel, maybe is the right word, but it's better to say they don't experience remorse. Uh, they don't experience uh, empathy. Um, they can kill and hurt others and feel nothing. Um, and you know that is when you work with like when you work with like me and you work with juveniles, um, you find one of the keys uh, to rehabilitation is teaching juveniles empathy. Well, when you're dealing with a psychopath, you're dealing with an individual who uh, cannot develop empathy towards others, uh, which makes uh, rehabilitation of such individuals almost impossible. The secondary psychopath, on the other hand, the dissocial psychopath, on the other hand, uh, forms human attachments. They have those ability. Uh, usually it's two deviant subgroups uh, rather than mainstream society, but both are possible. Uh, they are more than capable of forming uh, human relationships, and that's why we say these secondary and dissocial psychopaths under Harris typology are not true psychopaths. They really are not. Um, whether or not, and, and sometimes you'll get the uh, secondary disocial psychopath who um, pretends not to have emotional attachment. Um, they may repress their emotions, uh, which will, you know, is, is, uh, is an internal coping mechanism for dealing with their behavior. But it is not true absence of emotion, it is just repressed, um, repressed emotions and feelings. Okay, the psychopaths. Let's let's just talk about psychopaths. No, sorry. Um, watched Psycho far too many times. I probably should have watched it before I started this video just for fun. Okay, behavioral manifestations of uh, psychopaths. Uh, first, they are charming and verbally affluent. Um, verbally fluent. They are. They appear well educated uh, and knowledgeable. Uh, they are very skilled at talking themselves out of trouble. Uh, but if you watch, and if you just watch uh, a psychopath on the surface, a man like you know someone like Ted Bundy, um, they are they're the nicest people you ever want to meet, unless they're killing you. Um, they're charming. They're well mannered. 
you'd think they had really good social skills. Uh, they don't, but they mimic social skills really well. Um, their verbal acuity is amazing. They have um, excellent grammar and diction. They would make very good public speakers. Um, in social situations, uh, they uh, are very skilled at making small talk, at um, making others believe that they know more than they do. Um, but if you watch them carefully, if you really listen to a psychopath, you'll notice they tend to jump from subject to subject. Um, and what they talk about lacks real substance. They, they get the surface. Um, they can tell you uh, enough about almost any subject to make you think uh, they're, they're knowledgeable about that subject. But they're really just, kind of, well, they're basically faking it. Um, uh, their, their speech tends to be filled with uh, stock phrases, uh, repetition of the, uh, repetitions of the same ideas, uh, word approximations, uh, abstract terms, and jargon. Um, they just kind of tend to fill. Uh, but if you don't know any better, you they could pretend to be a doctor and you could be fooled. Um, they're that convincing. Uh, when it comes to psychological testing, um, they, on, say, for instance, intelligence tests, they tend to score extremely high on intelligence tests. And uh, one of the... Uh, unusual features of psychopath is they tend to be extremely intelligent individuals. Um, consider uh, Ted Bundy, uh, the man, uh, very intelligent, uh, very uh, did a very good job without a legal without a law degree, um, with nothing other than reading uh, law books. Uh, managed to do a very effective job uh, of defending himself. Uh, uh, fortunately for uh, the state of Florida and for the rest of the world, uh, Florida prosecutors uh, were, were at the top of their game because um, uh, if you had uh, a Marsha Clark level of preparation when they had put Bundy uh, up for trial, uh, he, he might have won. The psychopath is not mentally disordered uh, by traditional standards. And by mentally disordered, they're, uh, they're able to focus their attention. Um, you know, and they're able to focus their attention on, I mean, they're able to split their attention. Uh, they're not confused. Uh, they don't get sidetracked easily. Uh, they lack visible or no noticeable symptoms of mental disorder. Um, again, you're, if you're talking to this individual in a social si social situation uh, or a job interview, it's like a business environment, uh, you would never know that they were psychopath. There are no uh, there are no outward signs. Uh, there's there's even under heavy stress, uh, these individuals may remain calm, uh, very controlled. Um, again, you you meet these people on the street. They could be members of your church, your school. Um, and you just, you'd never know. Um, other traits, they have uh, flat emotional uh, reactions. Um, they have an inability to give affection. And their, their emotional reactions to things are superficial. Um, and largely that is because they're faked. Um, as a psychopath grows uh, during childhood and adolescence, uh, the psychopath very quickly uh, realizes, consciously or subconsciously realizes, that uh, people around him are different, or that he's different from other people, that uh, people react differently to things. And it doesn't take long for the growing psychopath to realize that uh, he feels different, uh, that people look at him and notice him if uh, he or she doesn't react to things the same way, and so the psychopath, very psychopath, very observant individuals, uh, watch how other people react to stimuli in the environment and mimic it. Uh, and so, again, while they feel no emotion, they can convince you that they do. Um, they have a complete disregard for the truth. Uh, these are uh, they're liars. Uh, they're very good at it. Um, they tend to be uh, unreliable. Uh, 
and irresponsible individuals. Um, you know, part of being reliable, part of being responsible is uh, forming an emotional attachment to duty or responsibility. And these guys can't form that attachment, and so they tend to be a little un un unreliable. Um, now, while this is, I, I find this a little amusing, um, you'll find that most psychopaths don't drink. Well, let me put it this way. I think most psychopaths shouldn't drink if they want to stay hidden. Because this inability to feel emotion, uh, when they drink, alcohol has a strange effect on them, even in small amounts. Uh, alcohol tends to prompt vulgarity. Uh, and then very loud and boisterous behavior. When they get drunk, um, they seem to cut loose. Uh, they get loud, they get vulgar, uh, they lose that calm demeanor. Um, I, I gotta wonder sometimes if, uh, I don't think there's a police department in America that would, they would, they would call it an acceptable interrogation technique, but I gotta wonder if you were interrogating a psychopath, if you could be more successful if you gave him a beer. Uh, future police officers and current police officers uh, do not suggest to your to your commanders and your and your uh, police chiefs and sheriffs that uh, your college professors suggested that when um, interrogating psychopaths you should buy them beer. Um, I will deny it. Uh, I will tell you. I will say. And in the video there was a disclaimer saying, "Do not do this." Uh, what else about psychopaths? Uh, they have an excessive use of instrumental aggression. If criminal, their criminal acts are very typically impulsive, uh, which is an interesting contrast to their normal behavior. Normally, they're very controlled individuals, um, but their criminal acts tend to be impulsive. Um, there are even some psychologists that disagree with psychopathies lack of uh, not being in the DSM. Um, some people, even some psychologists, don't, even, don't say that psychopathy is uh, not an actual disorder. It's, it's not real. Um, there's enough debate that, again, it's not in the DSM-4. The cardinal trait, the most important, or the, the fundamental trait of psychopathy, uh, is a psychopath's lack of remorse or guilt. Uh, te the technical term for that is semantic aphasia. S-E-M-A-N-T-I-C-A-P-H-A-S-I-A, -A -A, semantic aphasia, yay, spelling bee. Uh, it is, you could consider this not just a lack of remorse or guilt, you could call this a lack of attachment to other human beings. Uh, this feature is, is referred to different ways by different researchers, different authors, um, Checkley in his 76 book called it the defect and affect. Um, that's my personal favorite just because it's fun to say defect and affect. Go ahead and say it. It's got a nice little rhythm, it's got a little rhyme to it. Defect and affect. Defect and affect. Defect. Sorry. Um, Hare, that we were talking about earlier, calls it a lack of empathy. Um, he's also referred to it as an absence of conscience. Um, Yoxlin and Seminow in 76 referred it to referred to it as a failure to put oneself in another's position. In other words, a lack of empathy. Uh, I guess that was their fancy way of saying no empathy. Um, Malloy in 1988 called it a fundamental disidentification with humanity. Um, nice fa fancy definition, also pretty nice. Fund fundamental disidentification with humanity. Not a bad not a bad description either. But again, defect effect. I, I like that. It's fun to say. This inability to experience human emotion is what makes psychopaths prone to criminal behavior, uh, and more prone to criminal behavior than individuals who, uh, more prone than non-psychopaths. How about that? Uh, research on psychopathy, um, or particularly research on the emotional uh, inability of psychopaths, the defect and affect. Uh, indicates that psychopath, psychopaths may experience some forms of emotion in certain situations. Uh, um, again, it's got to be really intense for them to, to, to experience emotion. Um, others say that psychopaths may express emotional experience differently than non-psychopaths. And so there's a school of thought that says, okay, it's not that they don't feel it, they just express it differently. 
um, I guess if expressing emotion like Commander Spock from Star Trek uh, is a matter of expressing emotion, then perhaps. Um, actually, if you watch Star Trek, uh, Mr. Spock, uh, it may be, a, a, you know, while that's normal for the Vulcan race, and if you non-Trekkies that don't know what I'm talking about, sorry, go watch Star Trek. Um, while that's normal for the Vulcans, that might actually be a decent uh, portrayal of psychopathy with the exception of the violence and the, and the criminal behavior. Uh, you know, this is in Star Trek mythology, this is the, uh, the race, the Vulcan race that Spock comes from. This is their individuals that uh, don't process emotion well. Um, okay, some of you Trekkies are going to correct me and say they do, pre they do express emotion, they repress it, but go with the analogy. Um, if you watch Star Trek, um, especially the new Star Trek, you'll see Mr. Spock get angry. Um, but that's about the only emotion that you will see him express. And it takes um, his planet blowing up and uh, his mother dying and Captain Kirk, or Cadet Kirk at the time, it takes Kirk um, continually pressing his buttons uh, for him to do it. And see this idea... Um, Takes some express uh, intense uh, circumstances. Hey, I got to use Star Trek in a, in a, in a lecture. Cool. Uh, yes, I'm a nerd. Deal with it. What else research say? Uh, research says that psychopaths uh, experience of emotion may depend upon their motivation and private agenda. Um, suggestion that psychopaths may choose. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then finally, research says the absence, the apparent absence of emotion, psychopaths may be explained by an attentional deficit, uh, a coping style, so they may be, it may be a coping mechanism, or in a disassociative process where they uh, subconsciously or consciously detach themselves from emotions, kind of like Vulcans. Uh, certainly the opposite of Klingons, right? Uh, kapla. Uh, Malloy in 1980 had a kind of a neat idea. He called it the reptilian the reptilian state authority. Um, if I'm going to follow the Star Trek theme, this would be the Gorn. The Gorn. Just kidding. Uh, Malloy hypothesized that psychopaths are more like reptiles than mammals. Okay, so they are like Gorn. Um, again, star non Star Trek fans, sorry. Uh, uh, clinical observation supports the idea of a reptilian state. Uh, they call it the, the reptilian stare. Um, it's kind of a visual predation, um, uh, scoptophilia, I guess is a Latin technical term for it. Um, or maybe it's for biologists. Um, I don't know. Psychopaths. <laughs> sorry. Psychopaths and reptiles uh, tend to be tend to miss They tend to be missing behaviors. Uh, that are products of the limbic system. Uh, reptiles just don't have a limbic system. Um, and the two things that, that reptiles don't have uh, that, that Malloy suggests that psychopaths also lack are hoarding behaviors, and hoarding behaviors in relation to hoarding to protect the future. You know, um, saving money, uh, planning for the future, that sort of thing. And then reptiles don't have social behavior. You know, um, mama alligator doesn't get all bent out of shape if baby alligator gets eaten by a lion or something. I don't know if lions eat ba alligator eggs or not. Um, just go with me. Uh, the reptilian state is not necessarily constant, according to Malloy, uh, but it is a psychological state that can be momentary. What about criminal psychopaths? Now, keep in mind, not all psychopaths are criminals. <laughs> Most of them are, maybe. Well, at least most of the ones that come to our attention are, but not, they're not necessarily criminal. Yeah, we'll say that, not necessarily criminal. The criminal psychopath is a psychopath who demonstrates a wide range of persistent and serious antisocial behavior. Uh, they are, and there's a lot of difference in research, uh, but the criminal psychopath makes up somewhere between uh, 10 and 25% of our incarcerated population. Um, and 25%, I gotta, I gotta call probably not on that because currently in the United States, most of our, <laughs> a huge percentage of our criminal population are drug addicts or people that are in prison 
because they've uh, come run afoul of our war on drugs uh, rather than they're actually dangerous people that need to be incarcerated. Uh, in the general population, um, we don't have exact terms for psychopathy. Um, we do know that uh, about 3% of males in the U.S. population are, have APD, or antisocial personality disorder, and about 1% of females uh, in the U.S. population, so it's a fairly rare disorder. Um, criminal pattern, uh, as far as the criminal behavior, uh, you see a lot of dispassion and violence with psychopaths. Um, with the exception of sexual crimes, sexual crimes of psychopaths um, tend to be more brutal and more sadistic uh, than other other than their nor than more sadistic, more brutal than their other crimes, more sadistic and more brutal than other sex offenders. Um, also, serial killers uh, with psychopathic features tend to be also tend to be more brutal and sadistic. Um, and they are more likely than other murderers uh, to kill strangers. When we study uh, homicide, um, maybe next week or the week after, uh, when we study homicide, um, we'll, you'll, you know, you'll see that uh, most murders are perpetrated uh, by someone who knew the victim. Uh, psychopaths, are, psychopaths tend to victimize strangers. It's easier to get away with it when you don't have a relationship to the victim. Klecky, uh, one of the guys you'll read about in the textbook, he wrote uh, probably the most famous book on psychopaths called The Mask of Sanity in 1941. Uh, it's a good enough book that we're still talking about it, and it's still in our textbooks. Um, it is considered the classic, or the foremost classic uh, research uh, material on psychopathy. It focuses on the notion that non-criminals could be psychopathic, uh, and so they make he makes some distinctions between criminal psychopaths and non-criminal. Uh, it is in that book that he defines the defect and affect, the inability to, and a lack of empathy, and he defines 16 associated, associated characteristics uh, of psychopaths, which heavily influenced Hare's PCLR, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, he also invent. He also came up with the idea of semantic dementia, um, which is not uh, some sort of can't remember disease, but semantic dementia is a psychopath's mimicry of emotion. We've already talked about, or I've already talked about this idea uh, that psychopaths mimic uh, emotion rather than feel them. He also raised the idea of psychopathy as a political issue and entered, uh, brought up a discussion as to whether or not criminal psychopaths uh, are sanctioned or should be sanctioned while non-criminal psychopaths are glorified as heroes in American culture. It's uh, an interesting thought. Maybe I'll hear your thoughts on it in the, uh, on the discussion forums. How do we measure psychopathy? Now here's where we get to this thing I call the PCLR. Uh, we measure, the most typical means used to measure psychopathy uh, is the psychopathy checklist, or the PCL, um, was designed by Hare. H-A-R-E, uh, not H-A-R-R. Well, if you've read the textbook, you know what it's how it's spelled. Uh, it takes the concept of psychology and operationalizes it for, for empirical research. Um, it has been revised, so now we instead of calling it the PCL, we call it the PCLR, which is Psychopathy Checklist Revised. Uh, keep in mind that uh, what is measured by the PCLR is different from antisocial personality disorder in both criteria. Um, and it's designed to capture both behavioral and personality characteristics of psychopathy based on Checkley's Mask of, uh, mask of, mask of Sanity. Um, and it is not an effective means for measuring antisocial personality disorder. Uh, cat, get off my stuff. Um, the PCLR is regarded as the first reliable and valid measure of psychopathy, and it offers researchers uh, a tool uh, to empirically study it, clinically assess it, and future editions, or editions that came after of the PCL, 
um, allow law enforcement uh, and other criminal justice professionals uh, a tool uh, for assessing individuals during intake. Uh, the PCLR, uh, what does it assess? It assesses uh, affective, that's a affect with an A, not effect with an E, affective, which is emotional, uh, assess affective, interpersonal, uh, behavioral and social deviance facts of criminal psychopathy from various sources, uh, used in conjunction with, and when I say various sources, they, it's looking at the background of the individual, uh, and we use that um, in conjunction with a 20-item survey. Um, uh, it may be in your textbook. Um, each item on the survey is uh, scored on a 0 to 2 scale, uh, and you have to be trained. Um, you can't just give. You just can't read the questions and record the answers and figure out somebody's uh, uh, PCLR score. There is a matter. There is a measure of training involved in how to interpret uh, the individual's answers. Uh, scoring again is very complex. It requires an extensive background information on the subject. Uh, any score on the PCLR over 30 is indicative of a psychopath. Um, individuals who score 21 to 29 are considered borderline. Uh, these are individuals that possess some of the features of psychopathy, but not all. And if you have less than 21, you are most certainly not a psychopath. Um, there are, like I said, there are multiple versions of this instrument in use. Um, uh, there is a screening version, the PCLR-SV, uh, which is a, short, uh, a shorter version of the PCL. Um, there is the PCLR, the PCLYV, the youth version, so one designed just for using with juveniles. Um, uh, there is the PSCAN, which is a research version. Um, it's also used mainly for law enforcement, probation, and corrections. It's a rough screening instrument for detecting psychop psychopathic features. You might use it during intake uh, if you are trying to screen an idea, some trying to classify some guys coming into your uh, county jail for the first time, and you know, it's probably a good idea to separate the psychopaths from the rest of the normal offenders. Um, the normal offenders would appreciate it much, and so would their families. Um, but it is, it's valid. We've done validity testing worldwide. Uh, worldwide, the PCL has been found to be valid. Uh, and very predicting, very successful in predicting psychopathy among and most powerful. Excuse me, it is most powerful in predicting uh, psychopathy among uh, North American males. Um, you all met Gus before, right? Not Gus, Julius. We had one look just like him. It. It's called Gus. Heading for almost twenty years. All right, jump down, guys. Julius, cat hair. <sighs> High PCLR scores, uh, according to research, has been associated with violent recidivism, uh, general recidivism, sexual sadism and deviant sexual arousal, institutional misconduct, that's breaking the rules when you're in prison, uh, escapes from correctional facilities, see Bundy, comma, Ted, and the assault murder of police officers. Finally, I would like to give you, I don't know if this is finally, but next I'd like to give you, uh, uh, we'll refer to refer you to the core factors of psychopathy. Um, when you conduct a factor analysis and, and research, um, if you are a statistician, a factor analysis is a statistical method where you take a whole bunch of variables. In this case, you take behavioral and psychological measures. Um, with a factor analysis, you would take all your variables and you would run them through a factor analysis and you would see which ones go together. Um, we call that clustering, but you just see and you try to group them in uh, using a statistical method called factor analysis. You see which of these variables hang together. They, they are associated closely with one another. When you do factor analysis, you tend to find two to three uh, of these factors, these, these variables, these groups of variables. Like this is my symbol for group. 
Right. The first factor, the, most, the strongest association, do not jump up there, Julius, you will knock the camera over, um, is interpersonal and emotional components. Um, uh, these things that measure uh, remorseless, uh, callousness, uh, selfish use of others, um, may also be related to planned predatory violence and the inability to respond to treatment. Uh, the second factor, the second strongest one, is excuse me, the socially deviant lifestyle. That includes poor planning, uh, impulsiveness, uh, an excessive need for stimulation, uh, lack of realistic goals, uh, educational attainment, and socioeconomic status. Um, uh, factor one tends to be uh, better at predicting general psychopathic behavior, while factor two is more strongly related to general recidivism and violent recidivism. If we were to have three factors uh, for those factor analyses uh, that come out with three factors, um, you would find the first factor that would involve arrogant, deceptive interpersonal style, um, enhanced self-worth and deceitfulness. Second factor would be uh, the deficient affect, or the defect and affect, and emotional experience, low remorse. Then the third factor, if you have three, uh, would be the impulsive and irresponsible behavior style. Um, in 2006, researchers have added, uh, just kind of looking at the way the numbers fall out uh, in most research, uh, researchers have added a fourth factor, um, and that is the antisocial behavior. Go figure. Uh, okay. Just a few random other things uh, before I end part one. Um, talk about female psychopaths. Uh, the reality, you know, we talk mostly about men. We talk mostly about men because we don't know very much about female psychopaths. There's not that much research. Keep in mind, psychopaths are so rare that studying them becomes very difficult. Um, and so female psychopaths are even more rare, and so studying them is even more difficult. Um, there may be some behavioral differences with female psychopathy compared to male psychopathy. Um, the females are less able to create long-term goals than male psychopaths. Um, they show a greater tendency towards sexual promiscuity. Um, and they may not have the same, or their defect and affect may not be as severe. Um, so they may have a stronger or a better ability uh, to process emotion than male psychopaths. Uh, they're less violent, they're less aggressive, uh, they recidivate less often. Um, their onset of criminal behavior is later in life than males. Um, uh, they do, according to Selekin uh, et al., or Salikin at all, um, they have at least the two behavioral characteristics of lack of empathy, though it's not as bad. With females, they have interpersonal deception, um, they're high in sensation seeking, uh, they're prone to boredom, they get bored easy. Um, they tend to have early behavioral problems, promiscuous sexual behavior, and antisocial but not necessarily violent behavior. That's females. Uh, you might ask, well, what about race? Is there any racial differences? Um, we're not sure because most, get off of their cat, uh, most research is done on white subjects. Um, some research, what little there is, suggests that African American psycho psychopaths are less impulsive than Caucasian psychopaths. Um, but While most of the research says there are no significant racial differences, we there is the suggestion in the research that, um, what am I trying to say, that the PCLR may not be appropriate for non-whites. Um, and the other thing is that we're learning that possibly the black, blacks that are labeled psychopaths are not true psychopaths or that we're not sure because the PCLR, the most widely used instruments, and it may not be appropriate for them. But the label, there is, well, I'll just say, when we talk about the death penalty, um, there's already a disproport, minority disproport, a disproportion, 
disproportionate minority uh, experience of the death penalty. And so labeling African-American suspects as psychopaths could be used in a biased manner against minorities, and so there's a hesitation uh, to label African-American suspects or defendants as psychopaths. Um, Juvenile psychopathy, this is a big area of research now. Um, it's, it's extremely controversial because our construct, our understanding of psychopathy may not be appropriate for juveniles. Um, if you look at APD, which again, is that, that's the closest uh, diagnosis to psychopathy found in the DSM-4, um, one, of the char- one of the criteria for antisocial personality is the individual must be older than 18 um, because psychologists believe that it's not possible for a juvenile to develop antisocial personality disorder. Um, we have a different disorder uh, that uh, juveniles displaying uh, the same kind of behavioral characteristics as someone suffering from APD. We call them something else. Uh, some of the psychopathic qualities are often confused as normal adolescent development. And so we tend to use with kids, we might use the term psychopaths, psychopathic like tendencies rather than calling them psychopaths it's, you know we wouldn't want to label the poor misunderstood youth um, but when we talk about uh, from what if I want to start talking about the cause of psychopathy and I want to start in childhood um, I would note that there are some common childhood indicators that have seem to be common among psychopaths um, there's probably a biological predisposition. We haven't found, while we suspect there's a genetic component, we're not finding a strong genetic influence. Um, we do find social factors play a major role in the development of psychopathy, um, possibly neglect, abuse, or um, indifference from parents, uh, negative school experiences, um, so Young psychopaths or growing psychopaths may uh, uh, may be impulsive, may have conduct problems, uh, problems with paying attention, uh, very similar backgrounds to life course persistent offenders. Uh, we'll try talking about, and I said, you know, biologically, there's a biological predisposition. Uh, or genetic, which let's give you a list of some biological factors for psychopathy. Um, we talk about genetic factors. Some evidence suggests that temperament, uh, linked to low arousal and fear responses, may be associated, psycho- associated with psychopathy. Um, there is not much known about the neurophysiological, neurophysiologically, neuro. Brain chemistry, we're not real sure. There's certain, but certain psychopath, psychopathic traits uh, are thought to be inherited. Um, some look at hemisphere asymmetry uh, or deficiency. Uh, criminal psychopaths may have an abnormal or unusual balance between the two hemispheres of the brain, which cause deficiencies in language processing and emotional state. Um, you know, left hemisphere activation hypothesis states that deficits in tasks associated with the left hemispheres. We're talking about ability to read emotional states of others based on facial expression. Um, hemisphere construction may also cause situation uh, which the psychopath can take, uh, or cause situation which the, hi- the psychopath can take in emotional cues from others. So they can look at the individual. Um, and say, okay, there's something that we can kind of guess what this person's going through, but they lack the ability to process it. And so, um, again, we got one hypothesis that says uh, that some problem with the left uh, hemisphere says they just can't prompt, they can't read emotional um, states based on facial expression, because that's how we mostly do it. Um, and then others say that it's, um, that psychopaths can, that the, uh, the brain function that allows you to recognize emotional states in others is working, but they just lack the ability to process it. So the brain goes, ooh, other guy, person sad, and then the part of the brain says what to do about it goes, ooh, I don't know, stare at them. Um, 
some associate psychopathy with a frontal with frontal lobe dysfunction. Uh, in other words, dysfunctions that interfere with executive or higher order uh, functions in the brain, such as the ability to organize behavior, um, memory, uh, inhibition processes. Those are all up here in the front. Front. Uh, this is where you do the planning and whatnot. And so maybe that's dysfunctional. Um, uh, for you happy Gilmore fans, some psychopaths say, some psychologists suggest uh, that there is a dysfunction in the uh, amygdala, am, amygdala, amygdala, that thing that alligators don't have, uh, the, the A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, um, this thing controls anger, fear, disgust, uh, it's also f uh, involved in short-term memory and learning, researchers have found it lower, uh, amygdala activity uh, during emotional processes uh, among psychopaths. And so there you go. Um, psychopaths, we talk about stimulation seeking. Psychopaths uh, may not receive the, fully, the full effect of uh, stimuli in the environment and thus need more stimulation to feel uh, ar uh, emotional arousal or intellectual arousal. Um, some have postulated that organisms uh, have an optimal arousal level, that people, animals, dogs, cats, um, have an optimal arousal level related to the cerebral cortex, and that psychopaths just don't get there. Okay, that's enough about psychopathy. Um, and part two, I will talk uh, in general about mental disorders.